Hey guys, today I have a video about probably my third favorite subject after beer and my dog Oswald, and that is squatting. This video reviews a new study that came out called Quadriceps Effort During Squat Exercise Depends on Hip Extensor Muscle Strategy, and it is just as exciting as it sounds. It was a follow-up to a 2012 study done by the same lead researcher, Megan Bryanton, and in the first study, what they did is they found the participants' maximum knee and hip extension torque at various joint angles, and then had them work up to a 90% squat in increments of 10%, so 50, 60, 70, 80, 90%, and then compared the amount of torque that they would have to produce at those joints to lift the weight to the amount of torque that they were capable of producing at those joints. And the resultant number was termed relative muscular effort, and that was the minimum amount of torque necessary to lift the weight relative to what they were capable of. And one of the surprising findings in that study is that even with 90% loads at the bottom of a squat, the most challenging part for your quads, the relative muscular effort was only about 60%. And that's kind of a puzzling finding because obviously a 90% squat probably represents more than a 60% effort from the quads. And so in this follow-up study, basically what they were trying to do was model hamstrings co-contraction. So the first study was looking at the minimum amount of work the quads would have to do to extend the knees. But in the real world, uh, they're never going to only be doing the minimum amount of work they would have to do because the hamstrings will also be contracting to extend the hips. But as they contract, that resists knee extension. Uh, they insert on the opposite side of the joint from the quads, so as the quads are trying to extend the knees, as the hamstrings are contracting to extend the hips, that's resisting the knee extension that the quads are, uh, that the quads are doing. So they developed two models. The first model assumed that the glutes and hamstrings shared the load equally. So if they had to produce 80% of maximum hip extension torque, the glutes were contracting 80% as hard as they could, and the hamstrings 80% as hard as they could. Uh, the second model assumed that the glutes did everything they possibly could before the hamstrings did anything. So for that same 80% contraction, the glutes were already contracting 100% as hard as they possibly could, and the hamstrings to make up the rest would be 50-60% contraction. Um, and so these would represent basically the upper and lower bounds of how hard the hamstrings could be working in the squat. Uh, model 1, assuming they contract equally, that would be the upper bound. And model 2, assuming that the glutes did everything they possibly could before the hamstrings kicked in, would represent the lower bound. So they took the data from the first study and ran it through these two models to look and see how it would affect quadriceps effort. Since the original study was only looking at the minimum knee extension that the minimum knee extension torque that would have to be produced to lift the load, the second study wanted to look and see how different hip extensor strategies would affect the quadriceps effort. Um, with model one being kind of the, the most challenging you could expect it to be for the quads, and model two being the least challenging you would expect it to be for the quads. So here you can see the data that uh, they got from the two models. The black line you see there is the data from the original study. Um, just looking at the external torque, uh, that would be the minimum amount of uh, net knee extension torque uh, that needed to be produced to lift the weight. So that's not taking into account uh, hamstrings co-contraction at all. The uh, red line is model one. That's the one that assumed that hamstrings and glute contraction uh, increased at the same rate. So um, you know, for every uh, X amount of glute contraction, you got X amount of hamstring contraction, the, the same amount relative to maximum. And the green line is model two, assuming that the glutes would do 
everything they possibly could to create hip extension torque before the hamstrings kicked in as well. And so what you can see is that green line, it's, uh, it's considerably uh, higher than the black line, the minimum amount. Um, but there, all the way to the right side of the graph, at the bottom of the squat, uh, knee flexion angles above 105 degrees. The peak it reaches is 87% of the maximum amount of force the quads could produce. So this is a 90% squat, so 87% of uh, the maximum amount of work the quads could do. That's pretty darn close to what you'd expect. Uh, the red line, on the other hand, assuming equivalent amount of glute and hamstring action to uh, produce the required hip extension torque, you see there at the bottom of the squat, it goes all the way up to 120%, uh, basically showing that uh, if that model was true or, or close to how reality actually works, the, uh, the quads would have to be essentially a fifth stronger than they actually are, 20% stronger than they actually are to create the knee extension torque required to, uh, to lift the weight, to get the weight moving out of the hole. So uh, basically what we can take from this is that model two, the one assuming uh, that basically the, the hamstrings were doing as little as they possibly could and the glutes doing as much as they possibly could to create the required hip extension torque is probably pretty close to uh, how the squat actually works in reality. And that kind of makes sense if you think about it intuitively, uh, because basically the quads, uh, specifically the, the vasti, um, excluding the rectus femoris since it's actually a hip flexor, but uh, the other three quad muscles and the glutes, they're single joint muscles. Uh, they, the quads create knee extension torque and the glutes create hip extension torque without really screwing with the other joint very much. Whereas the hamstrings, while they are powerful hip extens extensors, uh, they also resist the quads um, because they create knee flexion torque, uh, basically resisting what the quads are trying to do. So it kind of makes sense that uh, your central nervous system wouldn't activate them more than, uh, more than it actually had to to create the required hip extension torque to complete the movement because the more active they are, the harder the movement becomes for your quads. So what do we do with all of this? Uh, there are two major takeaways. The first is that you shouldn't really be trying to prioritize your hamstrings in the squat. Uh, the squat is, is a pretty crummy hamstrings exercise anyways. Um, it's, it's very overrated in that regard. I've written about that a fair amount in the past, uh, and articles will be linked in the description of this video going into that uh, in more detail. But um, if you try to squat in a manner that uh, maximizes hamstrings involvement, uh, sitting back more and uh, leaning forward quite a bit more, uh, what that's actually going to do is it's going to make the movement uh, quite a bit harder for your quads coming out of the hole, um, while also, again, sitting back more, increasing hip extension demands. So there's really no upside that you get from that. The second big implication is that if you do have issues coming out of the hole in the squat, um, if, you, if your butt shoots up and you wind up in uh, more of a good morning position, something that can help with that uh, is obviously strengthening your quads so uh, they can do more of the work. But a secondary thing would be to uh, work on strengthening your glutes because essentially the, the more they can do, the less your hamstrings have to do. Uh, it, it kicks, it pushes back the point that your hamstrings are having to contract harder and harder and harder to produce the required hip extension torque. So if you are finding yourself in a good morning squat position and you do have strong quads, the next place you should look to rectify that uh, would be your glutes. If they're not very strong, then even if you do have strong quads, you could still be finding yourself in that position. All right, guys, that's about it for this video. Uh, this uh, this video was a somewhat abbreviated version of an article I recently wrote for my website, stringtheory.com. That will be linked in the description along with the study that I was reviewing. Um, 
And so if this is a topic that interests you, or uh, if I said something that, that didn't sound quite right, um, rest assured that I probably uh, went into that subject in, in quite a bit uh, more depth in the article itself. So uh, go ahead and check that out if this is, uh, if this is a subject that interests you. Um, and other than that, thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.